Hello, everyone. My name is Thad Dungan. It's great to be here at reInvent. It's been the first time in maybe a year and a half. So, and thank everyone for participating and coming and attending this session. Um, so today we're going to talk about digital customer engagement. We've got a lot of this. This presentation will actually be divided uh, into two 30-minute segments. Uh, it'll be a great session. We'll start off with Rivian. And, uh, and then followed up by the BMW group. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, our agenda today, we'll talk about what AWS Automotive is, uh, how we're going to market. It'll be very brief, I promise you, because you're not here for me. Uh, also, uh, we'll then pass it over to Rivian, and Rivian will talk about how they are drawing a very close and personal relationship with the customer and the experience there. Uh, they will talk about the inclusion of guides as part of the vehicle life cycle and their use of Amazon Connect in their environment. Then we'll pass it over to uh, customer centricity using AI with BMW Group. Uh, we're extremely excited. We've been working with BMW as partners in their cloud data hub and how they manage and how they leverage and use their data to draw very, uh, to curate very personal experiences with their powerful brand, their iconic brand. And we're, we're pleased that they're here with us today. So a couple of things. Uh, when I talk to our customers, they're, they're thinking of technology, they're thinking of infrastructure uh, or platform as a service. They don't really quite understand that we also have a very powerful go-to-market around industry, specifically in automotive. Uh, I've, been, I've been asked by some of our line of business customers, are you an SI? Are you an ISV? Just what is AWS? So when we look at uh, automotive industry, we look at solutions that are purpose-built, that are focused on providing industry experience. We also uh, look at it from two ways, where our customers can build for themselves using our services, or we have competency partners across our various uh, workloads. And so whether it's build, whether it's buy, uh, even if you would like to develop with us or build with us in our Amazon in or our AWS industry products, uh, what is referred to as AIP, we want to provide working backers from the customer those three options. Today, you'll, you'll hear from two customers who have worked together with us and partner with us in these areas and these solutions. Um, one last thing I'd like to show is, as I've mentioned, uh, we go to market across eight workloads. Uh, these are strategic workloads. These are solutions that are supported by use cases. Uh, and our customers don't view these as silos or siloed solutions, nor do we. Uh, so when we look at uh, these strategic workloads and around customer experience, uh, you will see customer mo or, or connected mobility. You'll see software-defined vehicles. You'll even see opportunities where manufacturing, supply chain, and other of these workloads are combined to support the customer experience to curate those personal experiences, whether it's inside, whether it's outside the vehicle. And it would start from pre-sales. It would start through uh, recommendations and researching all the way to finance and purchase. Uh, and it would also include maintenance, service, parts, accessories. All of this combined with our Pan Amazon and Cross Amazon solutions. So, uh, when you look at digital customer engagement, we're really focused on those, those relevant and personalized experiences uh, that are curated to, to really improve uh, the targeting, the acquisition, and the retainment of those customers across that journey or experience. And as you'll see with both these companies, you'll, you'll see the scale in which they're doing it with, with data, uh, and, and, and being able to uh, get the data and insights out of there very quickly and to make decisions in a near real-time um, a, a near real time situation. 
So what I'd like to do is now turn the time over to Alejandro Martinez from Rivian. And for the next 30 minutes, we'll talk about uh, what Rivian is doing. And uh, then after those 30 minutes, we'll move to uh, the BMW group. Alejandro? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alejandro Martinez, and this is uh, Mark Phillip. And we lead the software development for our contact center solutions at Rivian. Um, at Rivian, um, we're, we're obviously trying to connect with our customers, and we really want to drive a lot of the day-to-day -day changes as we grow. Um, so we want to kind of showcase a little bit about what drives us here at Rivian. Forever means we're part of a bigger picture, preserving the environment for generations ahead of us. Forever is so important because we as a company are trying to set an example as to how we can care for the Earth. We're not just creating cars. We believe that there's a more responsible way to explore the world. We want to enable people to do the things they love to do and do it better, farther, faster. <laughs> Forever is sort of a humbling word. This is, you know, holy cow. We need to make sure that for the life on this planet a thousand years from now, we've created an environment that is as livable as what we've experienced to date. I think about talking to my son in 20 years and saying, you know, how did we do? Cool, so that's a little bit about what drives us. Um, and as I said, our mission is really to keep the world adventurous forever. Um, and we really want to do that and help our customers along that journey. And ultimately, we develop this kind of circle around our customer in order to kind of help them in this adventure. So that's both our customer engagement center guides Rivian service. Uh, but really, how do we start? We're a really uh, new company, so we wanted to talk about our customer engagement. Um, so when we started, we wanted to get up and running really quickly. Um, so Amazon Connect was a great solution in order to solve for this. We wanted to be able to offer uh, a forum for our customers to reach out to us in real time and talk to us and ask us questions about our products since many of them hadn't actually seen the product um, in person. Um, so our customer engagement center was formed and we really wanted to make sure that we started documenting those, those touch points. So Salesforce was developed into our system. Um, in addition to that, we knew that at some point, since we have a connected vehicle, our digital technology suite would connect directly into Salesforce and serve as a single pane of glass. Um, thinking about kind of our architecture, um, we needed to be very scrappy in order to go live as quickly as possible. We offered two main channels. Uh, our big one um, is our phone service, which is our Rivian One phone line, and then also our live chat, which is still up uh, and running today. Um, this allowed our customers to kind of ask those questions. Um, but we also knew that we were limited on our hours of operation, and we wanted to take questions outside of our hours of ops. Um, so we were scrappy and we used the open source products uh, provided to us by the Connect team, such as the voicemail solution, which allowed customers to call in, record their voicemails, and then create cases inside of Salesforce to be able to later come back and answer those questions that our customers had. Additionally, uh, Amazon Connect offers a stream of our contract trace records, so that gives us some metadata about the customer, what the conversation um, is about with contact lens, and then also information about our agent data. We, want, we were growing, so obviously we needed to understand the trends that we were seeing. And all of this data was getting processed and being um, provided to our data lake team, which later helped us learn much more about um, customer engagement. But when we first started, we started with just the getting the customer engagement center up and running. So getting the customer engagement center up and running was absolutely critical for Rivian, especially as we ramped up our efforts to address the growing interests right, in our vehicles and our brand. So with the combination of Salesforce 360 and the integration of the Salesforce CTI adapter into our solution, we actually gave our agents a workspace that provided them a way to give a highly tailored customer experience while having access to all of our knowledge bases at their fingertips. This would eventually lay the foundation for how we would eventually scale our solution across the various Rivian teams as we continued in the next steps of our customer's journey and in Rivian's maturity. Yeah, and from that point on, we were 
starting to get uh, vehicles out to our customers. So this is our next step of growth. Um, in addition to just continuing to take those question and answers, that conversation about ownership, we also went international. So we had to expand our operations to not only accept calls in English, but now into our uh, Canadian customers. Additionally, we now, uh, like I mentioned, we had vehicles on the road, so we had to offer 24-7 um, Rivian service, which allows uh, our customers to reach out to us any time of the day with any questions, whatever the situation as part of their adventure. And then additionally, um, we, we fully integrated with our connected vehicle. So whenever a caller is able, uh, it calls in, that information is transferred over to our digital technology suite and we can actually get insights into who is the caller, where is their vehicle, and then also track their customer journey inside of Salesforce. Um, and so that lays the foundation to what we've done with Connect. Um, and then the next one is obviously our guides, which is very important to um, what we are at Rivian. Yeah, so the introduction of the Rivian guide was the next step in Rivian's strategy and customer engagement. We wanted to give Rivian a way to provide a unique concierge experience where customers were provided with a white glove service to help guide them in their journey with us. This guide service had to be highly tailored to the preferences of the customer. Now, what we did is that we extended the Connect solution to support direct lines to each Rivian guide. Now you as a customer could get the support you need from the guide who has been with you on your journey with just a call or a text. As we introduced more channels, we created a single pane of glass, as Alejandro mentioned, um, to create this holistic view of the customer interactions um, with Rivian. Ultimately, this empowered team to provide a highly personalized experience um, while, while providing context of all the different contact points um, with us. And thinking forward, we had actually developed a um, a componentized architecture. And this allowed us to quickly extend our solution to the vehicle service team at Rivian. Through the context gathered from the metadata in Connect's contact trace record, in combination with the connected vehicle data that we collect, we're able to dynamically route customers to the specific um, channel expert based with, with priority configura configurations in mind. Essentially, we've implemented skill-based routing to get the customer in front of the appropriate channel expert to best address their needs. Taking it a step further, we've also developed a support network that gives the vehicle service team a way to quickly onboard external parties into our solutions. Ultimately, this has led to, a way, to an elevated customer experience by providing them a way to get vehicle support based on their geolocations while giving our team the context of exactly what situation they're in so that we can best address their needs. Next, Alejandro will zoom out on the architecture that we have today and how we support this. Right, and so like uh, Mark mentioned, we were building out these services really quickly within the, the span of one year. Um, so our architecture had to be really resilient. And we continue to support the customer um, with the Rivian One phone line and many other phone numbers which direct them to the right team. And then also passes on relevant metadata about the caller, as well as Rivian.com support, the configurator, and so many other touch points in which you can actually live chat with our customer. So not only do we have our customer engagement center that's live today, we have Rivian service, and so many other teams that make use of Amazon Connect. What we've done with Amazon Connect is that we've really built a lot of microservices into it. So Amazon Connect offers contact flows and contact flow modules, which allows us to become reusable and offer new teams some of the same functionality that larger teams have built. Um, with our microservices architecture, we've gone ahead and provided information from the customer in real time um, while they're on a call or in a live chat. And then we're also able to pass some of that metadata over to our agents or to the agent's uh, platform that they're making use of to kind of better uh, tailor the experience to what the customer is expecting. Additionally, we continue to use the Kinesis streams of our agent data to kind of help us predict uh, our staffing requirements. And then our contact trace records with contact lens allows us to kind of understand um, the conversation as a whole and then make better sense of their frustrations. Um, and then, of, of course, Salesforce continues to be a big portion of that 
uh, journey uh, along with our digital technology suite. Cool. So y'all saw the first, or you all saw the first diagram, and now y'all saw the second diagram, and you can see that the architecture exploded quite quickly. And because of this, um, the automate, automating um, became absolutely necessary in order to scale to the rise in demand for our services. We continue to want to bring teams online as quickly as possible without compromising on the quality of the existing customer experience. So how did we do this? We did this by rapidly, um, we did this by rapidly um, reducing engineering overhead in onboarding and contributing to our ever-growing Amazon Connect solution. In the first path, or first step in the path towards automation, we've concentrated on the management of inbound and outbound channels. So everyone here who has used Connect before knows of the click ops needed to configure each of your inbound and outbound channels. And while the tooling that Connect provides is great, shout out to the team who developed that, um, our team needed a solution that would actually give us um, a way to move faster by batching changes into our solution. And we also wanted to control the scope of the changes actually being made. So what we did is that we aligned with our organizational goal of infra as code. Now, thanks Alejandro, it's all good. Uh, as infra as code. And what this meant is that we were able to basically take our infrastructure um, and move it into a way so that we can add audibility to the changes being made through things like code MRs to minimize scope collision and scrutinize the details of every single change. To, we've also done things like integrate our release pipelines um, to, promote the, to promote the changes throughout our environments from development to production. And overall, this has led to a time savings, this has led to better audibility, and has as well reduced errors when, we co when it comes to making changes in our environment. Yeah, and, and, and like Mark mentioned, since we grew so fast, this automation was really key to us, and a lot of it has been built because of the lessons that we've learned. With Rivian service, 24-7, 365 days a, a year, we wanna make sure that we're online and ready to answer our customers' questions about their vehicle. So we had to make sure that we can automate all of our configurations and infrastructure, uh, ensuring that we have zero downtime. Uh, and m we're working with AWS to uh, move closer to 100% infrastructure as code, which allows us to kind of better uh, a lot of those deployment pipelines. Um, we also are making use of a lot of, uh, of that data streams that are coming from our customers and also our agent conversations. Um, and we're learning about our customers' frustrations and how we can better tailor their experiences. How can we get them information that they need quicker? Uh, and additionally, we have to kind of predict our staffing requirements. We're growing, we have more vehicles on the road every single day. So we have to kind of strategically plan our hiring efforts, et cetera. Um, so this obviously is a lot of value to Rivian and to our customers. Um, ultimately, for us, uh, the utilization of the Amazon Connect APIs allows us to really create a lot of our automated tools to run the business. And what this means for the customers is that we're able to create scripts to onboard agents quicker to better meet their demands as we see traffic rise, along with an increase in uptime and the ability to bring on teams quicker. Sorry. Um, and then also we've built in a lot of flexibility to make sure that we understand the needs of the teams that are going live with Amazon Connect and then being able to offer them solutions that are flexible to what the requirements are. And what this means is that whether you're part of the insurance team, part of the vehicle service team, when the customer comes into you, you're always getting the context that you need to know how to best address their problem. Additionally, because we are growing and we expect to grow even more, um, we need to make sure that all of our features are componentized. That means that one feature that we build out for a large team, such as Rivian Service, may be usable by our insurance team. Um, and those are features that they didn't even know they needed. Exactly, and what this means is that we're able to provide the customer with the consistency and the experience as they go between different teams that makes it complete, completely feel seamless 
and it's the same quality of experience that they have grown to love and know Rivian for. Perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, next up, uh, BMW. Right. Hello, everyone, also from our side. Coming from a startup to a company that is there for more than 100 years. However, very inspiring to see that we also share common challenges, automation being named as one of those. So let me introduce us shortly. With me today is Raphael, our responsible person from our joint venture, Critical TechWorks, flew in from Portugal and Andre from the Boston Consulting Group. So what we will do with you in the next 30 minutes is to walk you through a journey where we want to achieve towards more customer centricity, which is the first, bringing our data together, making data available for all our users in the BMW group and illustrating our platform, our technology stack behind that. Second, once the data is available, the question is, and we heard it today in the morning, how important data governance is by, in the keynote, how to make sure that we can utilize this data best. So we, can, we will show you important factors once it comes to data governance and which hurdles we had to overcome. And then third is how can we leverage this data through AI in terms of use cases for our customers, for you to understand the customers better and to provide the best service in industry. So first, let me take you to your journey shortly. Um, we collect data every day, every second. When you drive a car, when you go with your BMW to a service, to a dealer, at each, at each and every event, data is produced. But not only during dealer visits, service visits, or driving a car, for sure, more and more popular and more and more important for us is the interaction through mobile applications, the My BMW app, named as one example. But also, whenever you configure a car, book a test drive. So we have a lot of channels to interact with you, which helps us to understand customer demands better. But it also brings the challenge with it, how to bring this data together. And this is something we will um, deep dive in the next, uh, in the first section, in order to achieve the right-hand side here, making really next level use cases out of that. Understanding customers better, making demand forecasts, securing our competitive position and enhancing it, and also utilize our associates all over the place, all over the world at the BMW Group to leverage the great value of data. And how we do this and which technology with AWS is behind it and where we started and where we are, Raphael will explain you. Thanks, Stefan. All right, so when we started it almost three years ago, or even a little bit um, more than that, we knew uh, we had a diversity of markets and uh, sources that we needed to integrate because at the time there was already a strategy from the data transformation office in BMW to bring all this data that was scattered around many markets in uh, different systems in their own implementations and we needed to gather this data into a single uh, source of truth which is uh, which was by then envisioned by the data transformation office uh, to be a uh, platform on AWS, which is called the Cloud Data Hub, um, a short CDH. And this is where uh, a data lake was formed to get all this data from different markets. And uh, having a small team or of just probably 12 people at the time, 
We um, started off by learning all uh, these AWS abilities and tools and services and also uh, getting um, to know how the CDH envisioned the, the, the standard architecture for all of the implementations we did. Um, and as a pilot market, we started by having ad hoc implementations to bringing data into the cloud and to get it uh, readily available for being then consumed by uh, our uh, analytics um, platforms. Um, so uh, rapidly we, we got into a point that we figured out this wouldn't work for us, like having um, very different implementations in, in different markets. We needed to scale it up, not only because we needed to have speed in development and standard approach to each market, but also we needed to operate it then. And as we increased our scope and fruit footprint in the markets, we needed a single way of operating it. So, but having the technical solution to implement it wasn't enough. Um, the markets were scattered around the globe. We needed data assets from almost all of them. And we needed to enable not only the technological side, but also enable the startup management on, on their side. So we started building value on top of our technical solutions. And with the great experience we've had collected so far and learning by mistake, we gathered also a set of uh, blueprints on the management side, so guidelines on how you could bring your data into the cloud, not only by using our platform, but also complying with all the BMW standards and also with uh, the components we, you needed just to have it ready to come to the cloud. So how did we do it? Uh, we went from a scattered implementation from each market and we built a robust framework that uh, brings a lot of features by default and allows you to have a configuration-based approach when bringing your data assets into the cloud. So the, the markets didn't have the IT capacity or they didn't have the, um, the, the, the technical knowledge to do it. Uh, so we, we wanted to reduce complexity on their side by bringing it for, to our side and to have it uh, encapsulated on, on our solutions. And so um, we just, a couple of lines of uh, configuration, you could get data from your on-premises systems into the cloud data hub where it then sits on the data lake and you can access it through a democratized um, uh, solution and also uh, with proper governance uh, on the data scope. Um, then if you look at the, at, at the example here, if you define just a couple of settings for your configuration on top of the default configurations the framework already brings uh, and just by clicking uh, to apply it, you would get hundreds of services or objects deployed to AWS, and you would get also the transformation scripts to bring the data in, right? This is all, all, all integrated then with the metadata uh, control system on CDH, and everything will be uh, in a standardized way in the cloud. Also, we um, were concerning of our growing teams, so how could we use the same standard implementation on the cloud and with a growing team of developers, which by that time we were almost 80, uh, so we grew a lot, and we were kind of blocking each other in terms of how can I add my features on top of my colleagues' features? How can I test it without impacting their work? So we created this cool feature um, which is sandboxing in the same AWS account. And we get this by having a full end-to-end -end, um, development lifecycle, which allows a develop single developer to be working on the same stuff as their peers without impacting their work. So we create um, a workspace. It, this is all based in, in infrastructure as code. Terraform is the fuel uh, for this. And we um, then uh, isolate each developer change, so it could be tested individually, and then once approved, it's then integrated with all the changes from other developers. 
This also comes with end-to-end uh, -end CI CD. Uh, so the deployments are automatically done with proper change management in between. So now coming to some of the features, and uh, it's important to say that uh, the, the framework is, is built upon the two main stacks. So these are the base stacks we have. And why is this? Because uh, we identify two very different stages in the data pipeline, or the, the data lifecycle. And the first one is the provider side of it. So how do we get all these data assets in the cloud from each market and their uh, particular systems. And this is the data lake approach. So ingesting data into the cloud, getting it uh, cleaned up and transformed in a basic way so it then can be uh, shared and published across the BMW landscape. And the second stack we have is the consumer part. So how we then leverage these data assets together, we blend them, we enrich them, we bring the business logic into it and derive KPIs and machine learning um, applications. Um, one or two very important features that are outside of the regular uh, offers that the AWS does is that we also brought dynamic triggering to our solutions. So most of the markets, they uh, only update or share their data assets once a day, sometimes once a week. And um, the SLAs are not very clear, and we need to have a dynamic way of getting data from them. Instead of having a batch update running on a schedule, we have a lightweight function that, we that will go, go into the data sources, check if data is available. If it is, just run the uh, processes. Then, um, also very important, is the generic incremental module. Uh, this allows us to be very agnostic to the data sources. So many data sources, they don't have a means for uh, incremental loads. So we just have to rely on batch updates. And this on the provider side, we deal with it by adding metadata to these published data assets in the cloud. So then the consumers can decide if they want to build their applications based on delta loads of data, thus reducing the cost and also increasing performance. Third one to be referred is uh, our uh, set of libraries. Um, so these last three years, we've been adding more and more to it in terms of helpers and uh, uh, utils. So you can get uh, most of your typical transformations from functions from, uh, from Spark, but we also add to it with very specific BMW needs. So uh, things like anonymization, transformation of uh, vehicle, vehicle identification information. This is very specific to BMW, and we publish them and share them so you don't have to do it all over again. You don't have to do the same mistakes we did, and this is all taken care of for you. With that being said, um, go back to Stefan, so then we can uh, deep dive into uh, one of the use cases. Great. Thanks, Raphael. So summing up, now the data is ingested. It's available for us. It's actually also controlled. Um, and now the question is, how can we make it or how can we enrich it and how can we start leveraging it? Now, just first a look back where we came from and where we are going to go to. You can imagine in a, in a company such as BMW with a great history, obviously we are, have established processes that first needs to be automated. This is something which is our core or which has been our first step to do, really to automate our processes, to automate our um, data provisioning in the way we measure our efficiencies. The second and probably most important thing is how to secure data governance and how to establish it. Once we want to automate services and automate processes through data, obviously we have to think about different topics. So 
First is how can we identify data owners that really take responsibility in our organization that data is of high quality, that we can really derive critical business decisions out of that. How can we ensure completeness of data? And how can we ensure for sure also that we have seen today the balance between controlling the data and make it accessible, that this balance is at the best level possible, yeah? that we have really the highest amount of sharing, but also the highest amount of control on the same side. Third is we have to overcome tech challenges. As Raphael said, for sure, not in every market we have cloud engineers, available data engineers, data scientists. So we had to, let's say, leverage our existing great skills and continuously train them together or combined with enriching the technology stack. And last but not least, and this brings me to the core of our what we call granular performance management, is how can we ensure that we, if we measure things like the amount of sold cars, stock, the amount of orders, if we measure that in North America, that it's the same standard and the same way how we measure it in Asia, in Germany, all around the world, that we really compare things, because this is essential once we drive our processes through data, that not only the KPIs are identical, but really also the definition out of that, that people really talk about the same things and interpret the data in the same way. And this cube is the visualization of the aforementioned challenges. It's our granular performance management group, uh, cube and really the core or our backbone of all the use cases that we will develop out of that. And this is really a journey. So it started basically three years ago. We started it in Europe where we, same with uh, the technology stack, as Rafael mentioned, very small, um, that we standardized things. We established data governance roles. We established really products, technical products, how to ensure data quality to decide if I reload my entire cube with new data and refresh it, if the, the quality is really reliable, or if I remain probably with a day old data, but this is high quality secured so that my business decisions on top of that are not in danger. And now we are scaling it towards North America, towards, towards Asia Pacific and the rest of the world that it really um, scales. It's not a one-dimensional scaling for sure. So the second dimension is we are adding more and more business units to this data cube that we can also scale in terms of um, the data that we bring together. So from sales, from finance, Andre will in a second tell us how to leverage it for stock, but also for customer satisfaction, for um, but let's say for, for merging with external data from legal authorities all around the world that we can anticipate, that we can understand our competitive situation, that we can increase our segment share continuously, that we have the correct um, actions that we, can, that we can do and so forth. And the third dimension of this cube is really into the depth. And this is where probably the in future, an endless amount of added value can be generated. So, and this goes all back to the previous slide where we started with automation as the first step. So we want to replace manual reportings. This is probably sounds straightforward, but still it's really important also in terms of change management. You have to take the stakeholders, the associates with you, right? In order to um, really showcase and, and show them the added value. So the first thing to do is really to automate the reporting and we are applying, for instance, um, AWS QuickSight for that in order to bring it to our internal customers. 
And second is to enhance it really by predictive, descriptive, predictive analytics, and then for sure applied, applying AI, um, which we will see in a second. So to sum this up, um, just a snapshot of what it means for us in numbers. And actually what I want to start with, I want to highlight three important topics here. So what we do out of our team for the BMW group is we provide different results and different use cases. And one important thing is for us, we provide data as a data asset with data governance, with standardization, et cetera. On top of that, we then build the aforementioned software products or the visualizations and the reports. And if you look at that, we have significantly more users of our data assets than at least we have for the, the software component itself. And this illustrates how this data cube is scaling because we have interest throughout the entire company that want to consume these data assets and let's say make them part of their day-to-day -day decision making, which is very important to gain trust and confidence. The next element I want to highlight is, as it's really for us a core important to think from a customer's perspective, we have also established, and this is also part of the change management, we have established rounds that really think from a customer's point of view for sure, but data driven. And it's really up to a board level. So we have a, a board council customer, is it called, where we really think always from a customer's perspective, data driven about next best actions, about our uh, how to strengthen our brand, how to strengthen our services to really being best in segment, best in class. And one concrete example that is showing how now to even enhance it through AI, Andre will show you. Cool. Um, so I think we laid now the stage to collect a lot of data. We laid the stage to combine the data, make it accessible. We still owe the company and our customers the value. So let's get into that. Um, if, if we talk about customer centricity, this is a buzzword been used in the industry for quite a while. Um, and there was a lot of small use cases and enhancement, but to really play customer centricity we really require the full game as described. And let me take, say it's a marketing example to show what it really means. Because if you think about an OEM producing cars, what does customer centricity mean? It's more or less for us means to match demand, to so understand what our customer needs, but then to make all the right decisions to fulfill it. And this is not how the industry has grown up. The auto industry has grown up in creating big factories, creating the assets to populate the factories, produce those cars, and then find the markets and find the customer in the market. With the increasing competition, with increasing volumes, obviously, there's now the question how to make a turnaround, a transformation to really come from the customer first. If you think of sales and marketing and take any function of sales and marketing, um, if you are wrong in reading the market, you're paying the price in, in rebites or you're paying the price in logistic cost. Think of pricing. If you are messed up with your pricing, you will pile up stock or think of stock, you create a lot of stock and you kind of misread the mark, market, the stock will age, you will have discounts to get the stock off. So whenever you are not customer centric, you are paying someone, someone the bill. And maybe let's take stock as an example. Stock is a very cool example because um, working capital, days in inventory, um, net networking capital becomes a very, very important KPI for many OEMs. So they're all focused on that one. If you're coming from a history where you were producing the cars and you put them in a lot and you were finding the market, to now forcing this paradigm shift to reassign, like, where do I need stock? Where will my stock turn and how to create that? You will require all the la uh, layers we have just described. You need to find out where your stock is, 
you need to steer it and you need to optimize against. Because you want to avoid both sides of the metal. Overstock is super unhealthy because it's aging and you use discounts to kind of get it down. Understock is equally unhealthy because your customers wait a long time for receiving their cars. You might lose, lose market because they buy their car somewhere else. So finding this optimum is the core function when we talk about customer centricity here. And to bring to life what we meant with bring the data together, it's all about monitor. So before we started this journey, it was super difficult for BMW to even know where are our cars at every, any point of time and to a granular understanding where they are used. When we kind of create this transparency and monitor where they are, we need to ask the question how to navigate, how to build all the right KPIs and the performance management around that, as Stefan described. But then AI hits the ground and say, like, now we know all that, how to optimize. And it seems like a trivial thing to do, but if you think of monitoring stock, um, it's not just about knowing where the car is. I want to know, is it on the ship? Is it in a national compound? Is it already used uh, in a showroom to be accessible to the customer? Or is it still a demo car or a showroom car? So we need to really understand where our cars are at any given moment of time and really go down to the maximum granularity. And just as we describe this journey of where our car is, you can guess of how many systems and many stakeholders this could connect to. So when we talk about the Cloud Data Hub, it also means about breaking silos, about functions, which maybe naturally and laxly haven't worked together as such. But then it also comes to navigate. So creating, reporting, standardized KPIs to measure the turn of a car, to measure where do we see demand softening or where do we see demand rising to be reactive and uh, react properly. But then it really is the cool thing of AI. And this is only the first time we can really talk about machine learning and really applying AI to all the foundation we have built. Two years, three years, or five years ago, it was impossible to do that because the foundation is not there. Now with this foundation, you can really now kind of think about customer centricity. So in the moment you see a change in your competitor's offer, you see a change, a slight change in the stock age or the stern, uh, turn rate of your cars. You can react. You can adjust the ideal stock parameters you want to have. You can reallocate volume. You can adjust pricing. You create an environment where you, you see what's happening inside your company, outside your company, but you create more importantly an, an, um, an control tower and a mechanism to really cater for that. So customer centricity, if you bring it together, is not a buzzword anymore. There's no excuse anymore to just make it a, a cool slide or a theme or a purpose. It is hard work. It starts with the foundation of creating the data. It follows by the question how to make this data accessible to the business. But then it's all about making every decision point in sales and marketing being steered by the same and transparent view about your customers' needs. Thanks a lot.